Jsem držel v ruce, takže to chytil jenom velmi, chytil, chytil, chytil to velmi zlehka, nespadl do té jako... Máme tady měnit tady tu věc. Já se ty docela hlídám. Okay, so for, sorry for the slight delay. Uh, I'd like to welcome you on the last session of today's DEF CON Lightning Talks and without further ado, I give the word to Shimon Priatka who's going to tell us something about automated visual testing of web applications. You have your 10 minutes. Thank you. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is Shimon Priatka, and today I am to I am going to talk about uh, visual testing. Uh, for me, visual testing is finding visual uh, differences between uh, images in a simplified manner. In software development or web development, it means uh, to compare the current look of our web, web application against our desired look of the web application. In the past, it has been made manually. Uh, as, uh, as manual visual testing, it can be really boring, time consuming, and uh, it will just ruin your day. I haven't made it myself, but I, I think that. So. Good news, we came up with a software solution among, uh, other, uh, among others. How, us, how does our, uh, our solution do the process of visual, visual te testing? Well, it's really simple. Uh, you write an Arquilian test. Uh, after the test has completed, there are going to be uh, generated some uh, screenshots and uh, these screenshot, screenshots are going to be compared against uh, the desired uh, appearance of your uh, web application and the result is sent to the web manager. In the process of uh, visual testing you may encounter situations where you somehow don't want uh, a part of the web, web, applications, web application to be compared. Uh, it can be uh, like uh, some date field on the web page that is causing uh, problems, that is causing the test failures. So uh, we involved in our solution masks. 
what is a mask? Well, mask is simply the area of the image you want to ignore. How do you create one? It's really simple, again, all you have to do is go to the web manager and click and drag the area you want to exclude from the comparison process. Now you may, you may, you may be thinking, well, it sounds really cool, I want to get involved in visual testing, what do I have to do? Well, this is it, you have to just pass these few lines of code to the Arquilian configuration file and it's done. We also have our server side of the application hosted and deployed on OpenShift, so really that is all you have to do and get going. What do we want to do in, in the future? We want to uh, integrate our project with, uh, to, to communicate and work with Jenkins and uh, we want to make it, uh, we want to scale it up, prepare it for, for the use of the larger, more complex project. And that's when this gets done, it's going to be, it's going to really stand out among uh, other products like this one. So that's all from me. If you have uh, any questions, yeah? Can you repeat it again? So um, the thing that renders the page yeah. to make the comparison the image, mm -hmm. you have to have a render against it, right? Like Redshift yeah. or... Like yeah, or... Oh. Uh, how do you make sure that doesn't change the render? Mm, good question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, the, uh, the load of the page is made by, uh, like, the... Uh, you know, Phantom JS, Scrum driver, what, whatever you choose uh, with the Arquilian settings, it's not what I'm. It's not what this applic application is responsible of. It just it just renders the page and with and with Arquilian Arquilian graphene, it uh, loads all the elements it has to do, and then it uh, begins the process of comparison. Yes. What's the name of this project? Oh, uh, it's Arquilian Graphene Extension. Yeah, I'm. How can we find it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well. Uh, I'll, I'll just email you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to write the <laughs> project name. Okay. <laughs> and. Uh, I'm just going to make sure because it's, it's uh, or I can write the git uh, uh, URL to, to find the project. Yeah, yeah. Can you put it in the GitHub URL on the browser? Yes. Yes. GitHub solves all problems. I need to turn off the microphone. <laughs> just drop it. Drop the mic. It's, it's, it's currently forked from the uh, original version, so that's it. That's the name. Okay. So. That's it. Okay. Uh, thanks again for your attention. <laughs> Thank you for your talk.
do we have Debar Shiray here? Yes, it was, but well, whatever. So, two in the so yes. Yes, yes, continue yeah. without scanning, yeah. like, I guess. Yeah. Windows, yeah. Windows want to fix it. So it seems everything's work now, so I'll give you the Barshi Ray talking about Google Drive and GNOME. Thank you. Hello. Hey. Uh, good evening. So I'm going to talk about uh, Google Drive and GNOME. And uh, apparently we have been working on this for six years. So not sure why, but hopefully I'll be able to talk about it. So I work in the Red Hat desktop team. I am Rishi on Freenode, IRC, GimpNet. I do IRC. I have an email address, and I sometimes blog. On <laughs> right. It's very easy to remember. Rishi is a lost case, so it's very simple. So the idea is to use uh, to expose Google Drive somehow outside of a browser, inside your uh, usual uh, desktop native kind of applications. So I am talking about things like Nautilus, um, an image viewer, maybe a file, read, I mean a PDF reader and things like that. Uh, also inside the toolkits uh, file chooser widget, so GTK file chooser, which means that if you're writing any application with GTK, it should be also able to open stuff inside Google Drive, open, close, uh, sorry, open, save, create new and so on. And also some big applications, for example, LibreOffice. Uh, LibreOffice also actually is supposed to work as in work, as in it should be able to open a file, say an ODT or an OXML file on Google Drive, save to it, and so on. So this is a screenshot. Uh, it's my own Google Drive account, and you have Eye of Gnome. And I think, uh, yeah, and you can kind of see that it's the same picture, which is open in the browser and also on the, on the, file, on the file manager. So not less Eye of Gnome and the browser. So it kind of works. So, so six years ago, in 2009, there was a Summer of Code project. That's when it started. It was by this guy called Thibault Saunier. It's a French name, I think. I don't know how to say it correctly. So, so back in 2009, there was this uh, Summer of Code project to somehow do this. Uh, it, it went uh, quite far. Uh, the code was quite usable, but um, not quite there to merge it. So it kind of bit rotted after a while. Um, and there are some problems with Google Drive, which make it kind of hard to actually make it work nicely. We'll see why later, which is, I think, mainly why it kind of bit rotted. Um, six years later, in 2015, uh, some things had changed. So Google Drive had a few iterations of their web API and the server, the, API, the, the, the calls that you make to the server to, to talk to it, they changed and so on. And a lot of things changed in those six years. But finally, we were able to merge it like after some back and forth, after some modifications of the old code, like uh, so on and so forth. So, so if you are using Fedora 23, it should be there. I hope you are all using Fedora 23. Uh, um, GNO or GNOME 3.8, uh, you can look it up for your other distributions. Uh, it should work. Uh, so it was not just me. Uh, it needed reviews and discussions and so on with a bunch of people. And so these three people are mostly r involved other than me, Alexander, Philip, and Andre. Uh, so here's another screenshot. This time it's events working, working with, uh, I mean, it's op opening a PDF file from uh, Nautilus. And I think the same file is opened in the browser. Uh, so it's the same file. 
so how does it work? Uh, so under the hood, we have this thing called GNOME online accounts where you add the account. And then once the account is there, um, the application just uses standard uh, glib GTK API like gfile, gvolume, gmount, whatever, gfile copy, gfile open, and so on. Um, it's the same thing if you're, if you have ever looked at the GNOME developer documentation for file access, it's just the same API. Um, it's kind of an abstraction over various implementations. So under, like, so bin inside that API, you have this thing called GVFS, which does the actual implementation for the, for like talking to the server and so on. Um, so if you want to open your Google Drive in any GNOME, GTK, whatever application, you just use an scheme URL, URL like this, Google dash drive colon slash slash, that's the scheme, and then you put in your Google, whatever, at gmail.com. So here's the thing. This is what took six years. So the main problem is that Google Drive is not POSIX-based, which means that like, if you create a file on a, on a POSIX-ish kind of um, thing on a file system, so you do touch slash temp slash foo, so, so slash temp slash foo becomes your, like, your unique identifier for that file. However, on Google Drive, which is database-based, uh, even if you can sort of see things like a file system kind of thing, even if you can sort of um, browse it as a recursive, sorry, uh, as a hierarchical file system, even though the UI makes it look like that, internally, they are all IDs. So when you create a file, you don't really create a path, you create a, like a blob, like an ID. So, so every time you create a file, the application thinks that it created slash temp slash foo, but whereas the, the, the actual file system or the database thinks it created some blob ID. So, so there, there's some disparity between what the application thinks hap and what the file system or the database in this case thinks had happened. So there's this thing called a, a volatile path. I can't really explain what, it, all, what it's all about. Uh, so unless you're an uh, application developer, you don't really need to bother about it. And you only need to bother about it if you're creating files, like n not if you're in a read-only kind of mode. And if you need to bother about it, look up this thing on the GNOME developer documentation. I, I think you can just put it in Google and s type GNOME, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It should show up. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So how do you deal with that? We basically, uh, what we do is like, if you are using the, the glib APIs, then we kind of prohibit you from creating another file with the same name. However, if you already had one, we kind of try to deal with it. Okay. But you cannot create another one using this, our API. Okay. That's the best we can do. And there are some gaps, uh, uh, small gaps which need to be plugged. Um, Hopefully you'll never notice, but <laughs> we'll get to plugging them. Because, because they're all due to this whole database kind of thing. They need yeah. greater changes in the way things work. If you open the file twice mm -hmm. and try to write from both uh, the rewards? I think so. I would expect the server to take care of it. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be very different from what, what happens when you type on the browser, right, from two browser windows. Yeah, I think so, like uh, Microsoft has one, OneDrive, I think it also is similar, and Dropbox, they're all kind of yeah, similar. Yeah, so it will basically give this specific yeah. percentage and Yeah, they all have this blob. Mm -hmm. If you're tweaking with objects, it's going to be very Yeah, blob, exactly. Yeah, so th that's it? Okay, thank you. your scarf and you'll take it to your popcorn farm. Okay.
Okay, now we have Phil Sutter talking about better mobile email. Please do that, do better mobile email for me. I'll hug you there. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm Phil, I'm working for Red Hat, um, and I have no time. Um, still, I want to talk to you. Um, I have, well, while thinking about something to present about, um, I clicked through Paul Field, Field's um, um, slides about better mobile email from two years ago, and um, I thought, well, been there, done that, mm, still doing that, but I've improved a little bit over his. Uh, so I thought, yeah, let's do bashing, <laughs> more or less. No, not really. Um, okay, so why do we talk about this? Um, I'm a notebook user, obviously. Um, so I'm sometimes offline, still happens, and um, I want to be tolerant to that. So I don't want to lose my email, and um, I want to at least prevent like I'm sending emails while, while I'm offline. Um, and all this, while I'm doing all this, I want to have my MUD in fast, as fast as um, it is normal, normally. Um, and another benefit of my setup um, is that I basically do um, backup the Linux Torvald style. So um, I replicate my mail gear, which is a bunch of gigabytes, m meanwhile, um, um, to several machines. And if one breaks or I mess the setup on one, I might still have the others, um, as long as I'm faster than the replicating process. But that's a different topic. Um, okay, what tools do I use? Um, obviously, I use MUD, just like Paul Friels. And um, the motivation behind this is exactly the same. It's, it's quick. Um, but in my case, I didn't like it so much with SMTP and IMAP. Um, so yeah, you always have to connect somewhere. And um, it does caching, but it doesn't do full caching and whatnot. Okay. Um, We'll address this. Um, another thing, central point in my setup is my own MX. Um, basically, I have an IMAP server running. And um, this will hold all my email in a central point. Um, it, it will retrieve um, new emails, of course, and I will use it for sending. Um, I have proc mail set up there and fetch mail and uh, whatnot. Everything you don't want on your, mob on the, on your mobile device. Um, for uh, the synchronization, I use MBSync. Um, um, in contrary to what Paul Frills used, um, which was offline IMAP, I used that once too, or actually quite for a while, but yeah, it's Python, and Python is slow, and offline IMAP is slow in Python. Um, so MBSync is a lot better in my point of view. Um, I use ESMTP, which is a very tiny relay-only MTA. So um, I can only use this for sending email. And yeah, I don't need to retrieve it because I do everything via IMAP. Um, so I don't need to have full post fix running on my yeah, um, potentially 10-year-old device, which I have in private. Um, and yeah, the only thing that I had to add was queuing support, um, which is there since then. Um, another thing, another goodie to all this is screen, which I use to make things a little bit more convenient. Uh, not a big thing. Um, I'll quickly cover this. Okay, how to set this up? 
Um, first, um, MVSync, which is the biggest issue there because it's in its configuration as cryptic as offline AMAP is. So um, you don't gain anything there. Um, but at least it's a bit yeah, quite straightforward. Um, this is already mm, quite the whole configuration. Um, it consists of two um, store um, definitions. A store is basically anything that holds email. So um, I have one for Maldia and another one for, um, um, for IMAP. And I have two channels. One which does, well, a channel says where, what to sync from where. And one is only for the inbox and the other is um, for all the subfolders I have in there. And some patterns because it's Simbra and, you know. Um, I have a shell script which runs mbsync in loops, and that's why I have two channels. Um, the inbox is synced every 10 seconds, and um, the subfolders only every 100 seconds. Makes totally sense. Um, so it's, I have quick email, and it doesn't always pull through everything. Um, next thing is um, um, ESMTP setup. Um, this is, yeah, the the first two lines are basically just for local um, delivery, so it calls procmail. Um, then next is the um, um, my default setup. Yeah, something I forgot. Um, there's identity support, so um, the remaining part is basically for when I'm sending email as a different user. Um, I'm using in this case an SSH tunnel to um, um, to connect to a different um, mail server. Okay, um, for queuing support, I need a wrapper, um, which does yeah, the enqueuing in case no um, um, mail server is, is reachable, and mail queue deliver, yeah, the, the name has it all. Um, in case initial delivery failed, I need a cron job to regularly retry. Um, the fcron teaser is just a simpler version, I'll skip that. Um, okay, finally, to hook this all together, um, I have a screen RC, which calls from, well, when I call screen with that um, configuration, it starts for me the MB Synkler and MUT in a second window at the same time. Um, and I have bindings for, instead of creating a new window, directly spawn a new MUT because it's single threaded and yeah. Um, that's basically it. Um, you can read the full story with um, lots of verbosity on my own wiki page. Um, there are um, project pages for ESMTP and um, iSync, which MBSync belongs to. And um, these are the important man pages or readmes um, that for. Okay, I have a few minutes left. Three minutes. That's cool. Um, one thing I could show you is that screen setup. Um, does this work? Yes, it works. So um, here's MB Sync running, and at least um, the loop, and it couldn't connect. Um, I have MUT in uh, the second window, and Control A and C spawns another MUT. And um, if I close it, the window is automatically closed. And um, my setup is actually a little bit more complex. I have it better described on my um, wiki page. Um, if I close the, um, the first window, or the second one in this case, it will close the whole screen. So, yeah, which adds a little bit more convenience in my case. Okay, that's it. Um, switch back. Questions? Did anyone understand what I'm saying? Does anyone use email? <laughs> okay, okay. So you can understand me. Mic's turned on. Well then, thanks.
Everybody gets to read my email box. So, sorry for that. <laughs> it's, it's possible to switch it off, but I don't really know how to do this. Because I do everything. I don't use yeah, it. Total transparency, right? Yeah, total transparency. <laughs> <laughs> Um, project lead for the OpenShift Commons and for OpenShift community. So I do community management. And um, I'm going to ask, how many of you, you're all, are you all Red Hatters? Is there anyone not a Red Hatter? What company are you with? Uh, you're freelancing? Huh? Oh, cool. All right. So there's a couple of you. So what we're trying to do with OpenShift um, mostly when you're a community manager, what you're doing is begging people to work on your project. Okay? So we're trying, I mean, it's the truth, isn't it? All right, we're, we're called cat herders and people who try and, you know, bribe you with beer or swag or t-shirts or, you know, free hosting tiers or whatever. We've tried everything at OpenShift, okay? Trust me. Um, I've been doing this for many years on lots of different open source and open standard projects, and it's the same all the time. And OpenShift is a unique project in that it is, um, what it's doing is bringing a platform as a service to your theater, um, and it has many components to it besides the code base that we work on ourselves. So there are a lot of things we integrate and pull along with us that we upstream. And with the new OpenShift Origin 3, um, we are pulling in Kubernetes. So sometimes when I describe OpenShift these days, I say it's a very value-added Kubernetes distribution. And we're pulling in Docker. We're using Ansible. We drop Puppet. We we'll might bring some Puppet scripts back in someday. But there's a lot of other communities that we touch. Um, and if you go to um, GitHub, I'm going to ask you to do this. OK, Adam, you're up there. You haven't done this before. Go to this GitHub repo and like us. Okay, I'm trying to get that by the end of DevConf to be a thousand. I will like you back. Star me. All right, this is, this is the reason I said I would do a lightning talk. You, I will use your email tricks. Go to GitHub. By the end of this conference, um, we are going to hit a thousand because I'm, I'm trying to beat the Kubernetes stars. All right, I'm also on the community management um, calls for the Kubernetes um, with a good friend of mine, Sarah Novotny. Um, so this is my real call to action here. Um, because there's lots of activity in OpenShift. Um, we've got tons of people contributing code, lots of companies. There are 35 different companies besides Red Hat that have contributed since the beginning of the project to OpenShift. Tons of code contribution going on. But that's really not enough to sustain a project. It's just a bunch of people working on the project together, which is a good thing. And I did go to the office, and there was this huge sign, and it was basically my mantra. Because I truly believe that there is a new model for community development, um, and we are calling it a commons. So, okay, most of you know that Red Hat is close to Boston, and Boston 
in the middle of the city, there's this thing called the commons. And back in the colonial times, that's where everybody had shared resources. That's where you bring your cows to graze on the grass. You set up farmer's markets now if you're hipsters in San Francisco. And so this commons model is, is slightly different. Because when V3 came out for OpenShift, we did a complete architectural 360. We dropped Ruby, thank God, and we switched to rewriting it in Go. I, my code name on Twitter is Python DJ, so I give away where I really like to code. Um, and we had this huge job. We had uh, 2.5 million applications running. That's a lot of developers running on OpenShift Online who were all happy. We had over 150 deployments that we knew about. Those were enterprise um, folks who had deployed OpenShift. And we had to get them all to migrate to this new architecture. And there are five evangelists and two product managers. And we were on calls all the time. So it didn't really scale. So what we decided to do was change the model so it would be more peer-to-peer. -peer. It's kind of like stepping back and getting Red Hat out of the way. So what we did, we t started um, commons briefings almost on a weekly cadence, um, depending on my travel schedule. I host um, commons. Uh, they do demonstrations of different functionality. Identity management's coming up soon. We just did last, yes, yesterday I did one on deploying OpenShift on OpenStack with Mark Lamarine. And we do deep dives into the projects. And um, then we have a great Q&A in conversation. And what was wonderful about yesterday's thing is that four people who I didn't even know had OpenStack deployments were on the call in the Q&A session asking questions. Because um, in the past, people just deployed OpenShift and it didn't use native OpenStack resources. And Mark was talking about a reference architecture to start using things like Cinder and making it work with the resources better and more integrated. So it was really cool. Um, we're starting up a whole bunch of SIGs. There's one for um, EDU and .gov now. There's an operator SIG. We're starting a telco SIG. Um, and we'll probably do one on OpenStack shortly. And I just got asked to start an OpenShift on CentOS one. So there's lots of that. And we have lots of events. So there's lots of people. A lot of them are origin deployments. I went to the OpenStack Tokyo uh, conference. And it's almost like coming out of the closet. Um, op there was I, w I gave a presentation, and at the same time, Semantic gave a presentation um, on, on platform as a service. And I, I was a little worried because they had listed in their abstract all the different platform as a services, Cloud Foundry, Open Diaz, Burano, all these other ways of doing application deployments. And I was kind of like, oh, I should really be in their session to make sure they don't trash OpenShift. And what they did instead was they completely outed themselves as huge fanboys of OpenShift and trashed the other three folks and talked about different things about our, our new architecture. And people came up to me afterwards and said, where were you? You should have heard this. So luckily, it was recorded. Um, lots of upstream projects. We now have, the, we had 35 folks who, um, different companies that have contributed. We have over 175 organizations that are public, publicly referenced, referenceable um, companies that are now part of OpenShift Commons. So if you go to the com commons.openshift.org page, you will see um, a huge list of logos and different projects. Everybody, there's a lot of the open source projects, CentOS, Fedora, things like that. But um, the majority of them are either people who have integrated things into OpenShift, upstream projects that we upstream, or people, who, most of them are folks who are operating platforms as a service that use OpenShift or enterprise deployments. So um, there are on the mailing lists over 550 people talking to each other. Um, there are a lot of people, if you're from Red Hat, join it. Um, I do a lot of work with the SAs and the consulting services. They reuse the briefing contents. Um, just this week, Infosys, 3Scale, and Weaveworks joined. And they're giving introductory briefings shortly on their services. Um, Infosys was has a huge OpenShift um, POC going on right now, so we're really thrilled to have them. And about, a, about three, three folks a week join. So it's a really growing, um, growing ecosystem, lots of people in there. Um, what we're doing with our different upstream communities, GetUp Cloud is a platform as a service that's down in Brazil. They've been running on AWS using S3. 
storage. They are porting their production platform as a service, public offering. You can use your credit card and swipe. They've got all the integration done to Azure in early June. Um, so they're doing some great work. Um, we're working with the Azure folks to get .NET containers working and be first class citizens on OpenShift. Um, Kubernetes, I think I said already that we're going to, I think, in my humble opinion, that we're their best enterprise route to the SDR. I can see you there. So thanks. Um, there's a lot um, going on, so please like us on GitHub. 977. What's that? 977, all right, that's great. We're getting there. By the end of the, by the, end of the week, I'll have 1,000. And, and then um, I think, what's Kubernetes at? It's, I think they're around 2,000 or something. I was like, no, I want to have more numbers than the Kubernetes guys so that I can prove that statement that we're the best route to enterprise Kubernetes. So thank you very much. Do you have, oh, I don't get a ticket. I do. Yeah, yeah. All right, perfect. All right, guys, is there another speaker? Oh, that's it. That's, that's it. it, it's beer time. Right. Stop, yeah. e stop writing email servers. <laughs> stop coding. Get all your friends to like us. <laughs> oh, okay, so we're not gonna catch up to them, are we? <laughs> I can do it. I'd like to be over. you from everything I see. Do we hug now? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. I had this different definition of, of mobile. Actually. Oh, I okay. thought you mean this. I mean mm -hmm. Email on this is crap. Yeah, it's, it's I guess I would have chosen a better, but I yeah, just yeah, took it over. It. it was still interesting. Uh, I'm not that power, not such a male power user. Mm. Uh, so I just, I just use evolution and that's it. Okay. All right, thank you very so much. Okay. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you, so too. you have to no emails from the offense. Yeah, and I actually think it's a good, uh, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> Nobody bothers me, so I can focus on doing some other work. Yeah, I started doing crazy things with my email. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I started having this encrypted email I sent myself to mm -hmm. some passwords. Okay. And it's like, okay, if that's not reachable, I'm still here. Uh -huh. And so I, you know, yeah. I started liking the fact that I can do searches in, in my inbox while I'm offline. And then even yeah. write, write email and write like code. The amount of email I get within Red Hat is so huge that I basically decided I only read email in the morning and sometimes in the once in the evening. Yeah. And for the day, I just switch it off. Yes. If, if it's really important, important there's an IRC. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would, ju I would just constantly get notifications and just do email. email, email. Uh, yeah, I don't look at notifications, I, I use polling, mm -hmm. so I yeah. sometimes just go to that and, and look through the folders. Yeah. And um, it really depends on my, my um, daily form and, um, mm -hmm. and on how much concentrated I am. Yeah. Um, but if I, if I want to, I can read Hi. a new email Thanks whenever I look at Thanks, you too. Because there's memory lost and you're yeah. effectively <laughs> not slowing. And so, uh, 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 yeah. you know, the storage the sidebar. I I used that once, but it, it was very buggy before. Or it used to be very buggy, but 
see what browser, uh, what folders have new files, have new mails in it, yeah. and you can directly jump from one to another. Mm -hmm. really, really simple. Yeah, there was um, there was some some hidden feature in um, in this MV Sync loop. Mm -hmm. It um, it actually w because MV Sync creates new mailsiers when it syncs, and um, so I have a small script which checks through. Um, which goes through all the subfolders mm -hmm. and creates a mod compatible mailboxes mm -hmm. file which I can then source. And um, which means I have so many mailboxes yep. defined that my sidebar would overflow anyway. Mm -hmm. And also since I normally use this um, four window setup on my small screen, um, I don't want to waste any any screen yeah. screen estate. Yeah. And as you have seen probably there's barely space for the email address and the subject. Yes. So I mostly right, read yeah. only the half of the subject before I delete the email. Yeah. <laughs> so that's fine. You're right. Okay. But if you have the screen, why not? Mm. Yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, Yeah, do you know the name of the place where they were going? I could give you some... 